Welcome everyone to the Sprague Market Brief on February 27th. I'm Taylor Hudson, joined by Hugh McNaughton. So today's discussion is going to be about a story that's been brewing for a little while, but it's getting more and more complicated every day. It's about refining closures on uh, the U.S. East Coast. Hugh, could you give us a little bit of background? Yeah, sure, Taylor. After the, uh, over the last year, or maybe a uh, year and a half or so, there's been increasing uh, evidence that U.S. East Coast refineries were not able to compete for uh, in an international arena where Atlantic Basin crude oil was really uh, dependent on world economics and U.S. refining was in a very much better position to, uh, like I said, to compete. So as a result, we've seen a significant shutdown of U.S. East Coast refining capacity from a peak of 1.6 million barrels a day in 2005 down to 1.1 million barrels in last year, 2011. And by the time all the refineries are in a, uh, are either closed or idled, they, we will be down to 650,000 barrels a day, a loss of 60% of a historical capacity. Now, Hugh, did this happen all at once, or you know, what's, what's sort of the timing of this? Because it seems recent to me. The, uh, what is recent, Taylor, is the growing concern over the impact of the closing of these refineries. Uh, it wasn't until uh, late in 2011, after Sunoco had already announced that they would be closing down or, have, or selling two major, the last two major refineries in the Philadelphia area uh, by the middle of 2012, that uh, folks began to sit up and uh, take notice. What, it, what exaggerated the situation was suddenly in uh, mid-December, uh, Sun declared that they were not waiting inf- until 2011 to close down uh, the, their Marcus Hook refinery. They were closing it immediately, and that triggered a, a fair amount of alarm f- from the analysts. So perhaps uh, before we, we really dig into the issue, uh, we think it's probably best to um, kind of go over and discuss the Northeast supply situation on its own so that we can uh, better understand what these refining closures mean. And for the East Coast, uh, at least for the Central Atlantic and the Northeast, supply of refined products really comes from sort of three major sources. Uh, the first source is out of the Gulf Coast via the Colonial Pipeline. And you can see that the EIA Uh, has uh, shown that pipeline coming up through Virginia into Maryland uh, and heading towards New York Harbor. Uh, The second uh, source of supply for the Northeast is uh, imports of refined products from abroad, and those are represented by these uh, cargo ships that you see off the coast. And finally, the third leg of the stool, if you will, is domestic refineries. And we have sort of two clumps in the Northeast. We have the ones down in uh, northern Delaware and uh, the Philadelphia area, and uh, a couple in New York Harbor. And what's happened is these closures have all occurred in the same uh, Philadelphia area, which acts as quite a nexus for um, a lot of product that's supplied through Pennsylvania and through these these pipelines up into uh, western New York. So the thought is, uh, is that if you have one leg of the stool go down, that being uh, domestic refinery production, then you can just simply rely on the other legs of the stool instead. So that would be more imports and uh, more colonial uh, pipeline uh, movements. Is that correct, Hugh? Yes, it is, Taylor. And just putting some numbers on those, historically, the East Coast uh, product requirements have been supplied 55%, 55% from the Gulf Coast. Uh, imports 20 to 25 percent and U.S. East Coast refinery production at 20 to 25 percent. So we've got a very significant loss of supply involved in the closing of these refineries. So after the announcements, Hugh, I mean, what's, what has sort of been the timeline or the history of uh, the response? What have we seen the last couple of months? Well, initially, I mean, after the you know after that sun announcement uh, in uh, December, there still really wasn't very much concern. Analysts uh, recognized that with reduced demand, uh, certainly gasoline continuing to decline, and uh, surplus U.S. refining capacity in other locations, there really probably wasn't very much to be worried about. Um, what then actually triggered more concern was the surprise close of the Hess, the big Hess. 
Venezuelan joint venture refinery Jovensa in St. Croix. It's a, uh, it's a 350, excuse me, 1,000 barrel a day refinery. And even though it didn't come as a huge surprise, Hess had lost a reported 1.3 million uh, billion, excuse me, dollars running that refinery over the last three years. It still was a, uh, it still was a little bit of a shock. Now, all of a sudden, one of those major sources of the imports um, that you mentioned, uh, the, the one of those legs on that stool, has has gone away, um, and that really did bring the situation to more of a head. So after the after the uh, cutbacks were announced. Did the consultants or the analysts that follow this market, were they figuring that it would be relatively easy to make up for the shortfall uh, with more imports and, uh, and um, uh, movements up the Colonial Pipeline? Yes, the, yes they did, uh, Taylor. They, they, they really did seem to be not a serious issue. Um, there was one overhanging uh, problem or maybe um, concern, and that is the likes of, the, uh, likes of J.P. Morgan, for example, in early – in early uh, February, came out with a um, prognosis that distillates, uh, specifically the, mi the middle of the barrel, was in global short supply and could, in the light of these closings, be uh, made even more, con you know, more of a concern. Hmm. Very good. So uh, what happened today that uh, sort of brings us to the final, uh, the final piece of this uh, discussion? Huh. Well, what we had today, Taylor, was uh, actually a very serious EIA analysis and a very good one. Um, and uh, this is what we're going to talk about now. And here's Taylor. So uh, the EIA issued a report today, uh, kind of an update on uh, the impact of uh, East Coast refining shutdowns. Uh, everybody can uh, access it for free uh, from this website here, uh, from the EIA's homepage. It's a 27-page report, uh, very detailed, very good. And uh, as we read it today, we had um, a couple of interesting uh, points that we wanted to pass along. Uh, first of all, uh, the EIA points out that while the Colonial Pipeline will be uh, relied upon heavily to make up for the deficit, um, in the short term, uh, it's not likely to make up for all of it. So there's going to be quite a bit of pressure if Sunoco Philadelphia really is uh, not sold and shuts down. There's going to be quite a bit of pressure uh, this summer and into early winter um, where the Colonial Pipeline expansion plans may not keep up with the incremental demand that's, uh, that's needed. Uh, so when we turn and we ask, okay, if we can't import it from the Gulf Coast on the pipeline, why don't we just bring in more tankers from abroad? Uh, won't that work? Uh, interesting point made uh, by the government today, and that is that, uh, sure, these idled refineries could be converted to product import terminals. Uh, however, you don't just flick a switch and run uh, diesel fuel or gasoline through a pipeline that was carrying crude oil. There's considerable modification that needs to be made uh, to these terminals, and there's limited connectivity from a crude oil terminal into a product pipeline uh, system like we saw on the other map. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of uh, key things that need to happen uh, that will happen over the long term, but in the short term could really be uh, a problem. So let's talk uh, specifically about uh, each individual product and, and what the EIA said. Uh, how about gasoline? Yeah. Uh, all the all the analysis, including the AI reports, uh, uh, Taylor suggests that gasoline won't be an issue. We're uh, we're already in full swing with uh, gasoline imports from Europe. Global markets are have a surplus gasoline supply. Um, we even, for that matter, recently now are seeing imports on the U.S. East Coast from India, which is uh, certainly a long way to come. But bottom line is, gasoline shouldn't be an issue. Did see an uh, interesting thing about gasoline here. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh market is a, uh, a different grade of gasoline, uh, and they're already talking about uh, Midwestern refineries uh, moving product into this market instead of uh, the Philadelphia area refineries. In fact, the report even had freight rates, for crying out loud, uh, to how, how much it would cost if Pittsburgh had a gasoline problem to move gas from New York Harbor to Pittsburgh via truck. <laughs> 20 to 30 cents a gallon, I think. Uh, Isn't that what they were talking about? I think that's what the number was. How about let's move on to uh, heating oil. Uh, how's the government feel about uh, 
d domestic refineries pulling back and uh, the amount of heating oil that will be available to uh, New England. Uh, e equally relaxed, Taylor. The um, heating oil production has been declining uh, even before the announcement of these refinery and or actual closing of these refinery. So you're saying that we never really relied heavily on these Philadelphia refineries to produce the heating oil that we burn up here, let's say in New Hampshire? Very little. They're, they were all primarily sweet, light sweet crude refinery uh, refineries and they made ULSD. All right. Um, and just to follow that up, uh, the government essentially said that uh, came right out and, and made some statements in this report that says that they do not expect suppliers uh, in states still using non-ULSD heating oil to have difficulty locating sources of fuel. Um, even mentioned our traditional uh, import so sources uh, out of Eastern Europe, primarily Russia, uh, would still be available uh, to meet any incremental demand. If we actually have a winter. Uh. Uh, if we ever have a winter again. But incremental demand for high sulfur heating oil. It's just not really a, a crisis of any kind. That brings us to our last, uh, our last product to talk about. And this is where the EIA really didn't let us off the hook. Um, they really uh, delivered to us the worst news of it all. And that's around ultra-low sulfur diesel itself. Yeah, well, back to that uh, J.P. Morgan uh, an analysis with forecasting a potential, I mean, talk about alarming, a potential return to a, like a $50 crack spread. That's valuing distillates $50 a gallon, a, a barrel, excuse me, over crude oil, um, where they're currently running 12 to 15 is, is an indication of just how tight the overall global distillate supply is. Yeah, I was actually surprised, uh, Hugh, when I read the report, uh, how direct uh, the government was about saying that foreign sources of diesel fuel are relatively limited, uh, that it's the Gulf Coast refineries themselves that really produce this high grade of diesel fuel. That is, that is the only realistic uh, makeup source for the East Coast. So then the confounding factor is if we have it in the Gulf Coast, why can't we just bring it up to the East Coast? Well, as your, <laughs> as your slide says, uh, can we just put it on vessels? We uh, put it on tankers and bring it, uh, bring it up here? If the, if the colonial pipeline is limited, which you've already pointed out it is, surely then we could just use the ships to make up the supply. Ah, uh, but there comes the, something called the Jones Act, which requires that only U.S.-owned, flagged, and operated vessels can go from one U.S. port to another. Uh, guess what? Those are in extremely short supply. So we have a situation here which is relatively odd. There's enough ULSD being produced in the U.S. Gulf Coast to make up for the Philadelphia refinery closures, except we can't get it. It has to flow to other places, Central America, South America, Europe, and then we have to import ULSD from somewhere else. So you had mentioned a possibility of, of what happening. Well, it, first of all, that is, that's ironic. The U.S., the, out of the U.S. Gulf, currently exports are running between 800 and a million barrels a day, way more than is required to make up for the shortfall on the East Coast as a result of these refinery closings. But what could happen here, as that last line says, is that we end up for competing with Europe for our for our ULSD requirements on the East Coast. Could sit, we could actually see a tanker leave the Gulf Coast, go to Europe, sit in a tank, and then we could buy it back. Uh, yes, unfortunately for all the cost involved in that. Well, that's very interesting. Now, finally, we want to just point out that, uh, unfortunately, the July 1st New York mandate that requires home heating oil go to ultra-low sulfur uh, complicates the issue. And the issues that are, um, uh, include that the government pointed out today are uh, the volume is, is sizable. Uh, heating oil in uh, New York uh, will increase the ultra-low sulfur diesel uh, consumption rate uh, in the Northeast by about 20% on an annualized basis. Now, that's very low in the winter when no one's using, or I'm sorry, in the summer when no one's using heating oil, but could be very high in the winter. And the increase uh, during cold periods was very significant. I was surprised to see it could increase 35 to 50 percent over the base ULSD demand uh, during the winter period. Uh, the EIA uh, looked ahead 
uh, and sort of thinking about the long term and essentially said, if we have a transition to ULSD heating oil throughout the Northeast, uh, the supply system is going to be, uh, become more seamless, one product, but in effect, uh, the commercial and residential consumers of heating oil will be competing with truckers uh, for the exact same barrel. So just to bring it home as sort of an overall um, uh, markup here, uh, gasoline and high sulfur heating oil, not too worried about a, uh, a, a real price and supply implication. Uh, from the closures of the refineries, ULSD, a different story. Uh, absolutely, and the implications of uh, homeowners competing with truckers for the same uh, for the same heating oil uh, has has uh, some um, raises some concerns. And and on that note, uh, you know, as we sit here today, everyone is reading the law in New York as uh, a go ahead. Uh, everyone is preparing for a July first changeover. Uh, however, we have seen over the last week. Uh, a number of articles pop up uh, suggesting that the governor of New York uh, may uh, give it another look here uh, after he's done with his budget at the end of March. We have absolutely no uh, inside information at all on that one. Just, just uh, wanted to reflect on the fact that we see it come up more now in conversation than we did before. Well, thank you all. Hope you have a uh, very good night. Thank you all.